Hi, I'm Ben Hansen. I'm an Associate Professor at University College London and an IDSI board member. This presentation describes the measurements used in the IDSI framework. The aim of IDSI is to improve safety and quality of life for all ages, in all care settings and for all cultures. In the past, using subjective terms to describe textures can lead to confusion and poor quality of care. We use measurements in other aspects of life. For example, in the UK, a large glass of wine means 250 millilitres, so there's no scope for argument. But in texture modification, we do need to define how thick is thick. Some countries have used numeric measures of viscosity to define thickness of textures used for dysphagia management. But as you can see here, the different levels are not equivalent. But more fundamentally, viscosity is a very specific scientific term which applies to Newtonian fluids. Newtonian liquids are very simple and include things like honey, water or oils. But almost all other naturally thick drinks, or drinks that have been thickened with a thickening agent, are non-Newtonian. And that means that their appearance in one situation, for example when spooned, doesn't necessarily represent their behaviour in another situation, for example when swallowed. For example, some thick liquids can appear almost solid, like ketchup or some thick smoothies, but when you try and swallow them, they appear very low viscosity. So in order to characterise these types of liquids, you need to test over that full range from slow to fast flow rates, called shear rate. One isolated measure on its own doesn't fully characterise the liquid. Performing this testing is time consuming and quite expensive, but many scientists have done this and published the results. And the measurements confirm what we see in practice that different types of liquid, starch thickened or gum thickened for example, have different characteristics. Rather than focus on purely lab-based measurements, ITSI were very keen that they wanted the standards to relate to what happens in clinical practice. Here we can see a video fluoroscopy of a swallowing study, where some of the fluid is being aspirated. And through the swallow you can see that at some times the bolus is almost stationary, whereas other times it's accelerated to very fast flow rates. So it's important that a measurement captures this full dynamic range. Here at UCL we've created a mechanical oral simulator to represent the compression between the tongue and hard palate. We use particle tracking software and pressure sensors to capture the relationship between pressure and flow. To make use of this lab-based research, it's important to have a measurement that can be used in the real world. Some researchers have used a Bostwick consistometer or a line spread test to test consistency, and this is used in some food industries. But these tests measure how a material slumps, whereas we've seen that swallowing involves fast shear flows and extension of the bolus. So it's important that the measurement captures fast flow after researching several different methods, we settled on measuring flow through a funnel, and we used a 10 milliliter syringe for that funnel, as it's widely available and standardized around the world. Also, it has a convenient 10 point scale marked. We used experimentation and computer simulation to look at the flow of several different types of Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids through, so that we could represent all different types of drinks. And here we'll see four different consistencies of fluid being tested. 10 millilitres of each is placed in the syringe and flow is timed for 10 seconds. Most people use the stopwatch on their phone to do this. At 10 seconds the flow stopped and the amount of fluid remaining in the syringe is our measurement of consistency. You can see for level 4 there is no flow and we would recommend that you need to test level 4 with a fork and spoon test. Using this straightforward but accurate measurement means that it's the same measure which gets used and reported in scientific conferences and journals, in the NHS in the UK, in hospitals and care homes, and everywhere from the best funded North American hospitals to rural underdeveloped communities in Africa. 
It's important to use the same dimensions of syringe as published on the IDSI website. If you use a different sized syringe, you'll get a different measurement, and that difference can be unpredictable depending on the type of liquid used. As I mentioned, at level 4 there's no flow, so we wouldn't recommend that you use the flow test. Instead, it can be tested on a fork by observing whether the fluid would sit in a mound above the forked prongs. It's also important to check that a material's not too sticky, and that's where we have the spoon tilt test. A spoonful of the material should fall off easily with a light flick and should not leave a sticky residue. This is intended to give an indication as to whether there would be residue when swallowing. For level 5 minced and moist, there's an upper limit on the particle size, and this relates to the sizes of particles that have been found in healthy adults after chewing a bolus. This limit of 4 millimetres can be identified as the normal width between the prongs of a fork. In food science, measuring the compression characteristics of soft foods can be done with a texture analyzer as shown here. And in practice, we needed to find a way that we could ensure anyone would apply the same constant level of pressure. The indicator of the thumbnail blanching white represents systolic blood pressure and it's approximately 17 kilopascals for most adults. This also relates to the pressures found in a normal tongue palate compression during swallowing. So it gives a standardised way to identify whether foods could be readily compressed with just tongue pressure alone. The particle size limitation in level 6 relates to the size of the adult tracheal opening and is intended that, in the worst case scenario, particles of food would pass through the airways rather than blocking them completely. This size of 15 millimetres can be measured practically as it's the same size as the width of a standard table fork. There is now a subcategory of level 7 regular foods that's describing easy to chew foods. Level 7, easy to chew. This uses the same definition of soft as we see in level 6, but now without the particle size limitation. Foods in this category would need to be broken up into bite-sized pieces using the side of a fork or a knife. And because this level doesn't have that inherent mitigation of a choking risk, it needs to be used under clinical guidance. Although IDSI have created tools and measurements that are easy to use in practice, it isn't necessary to use these tests every single mealtime. Manufacturers of texture modified products have all been able to use the same international standards. So if you're using consistent products and consistent practices, then you won't need to repeat measurements every time. Testing might be most useful for initial staff training, or regular updates, or audits, or where your products or materials change. So we'd like to conclude by saying that IDSI is a language to be used by you, not a law to tell you what to do. You should use it as a tool to communicate between colleagues and not as a textbook. Clinical judgment needs to be the best tool to identify a management strategy for a particular individual. And then IDSI is the tool to communicate that management strategy. The IDSI scale is being used in some settings for clinical research to help build an evidence base for the use of texture modification. And because we're all using the same international standards now, clinical research will be directly relevant to clinical practice. So these are the measurements and we advise you to use them as appropriate to your personal clinical practice.